Good morning. Good to have you with us. We're not shut down. I'm Joe Fryer. <laughs> yeah, we will be here no matter what. I'm Savannah Sellers. Thank you very much for joining us. We begin our show with President Biden's final stop on his European tour following the culmination of that NATO meeting in Lithuania. This morning, the president is in Finland for the U.S. Nordic Summit. He is expected to formally hail Finland's recent NATO membership and welcome Sweden ahead of its entry. Yesterday, the president wrapped up the NATO summit by holding talks with Ukraine's President Zelensky. That meeting came after Zelensky expressed frustration at NATO's refusal to offer a timetable for Ukraine's membership. Instead, NATO allies pledged their long-term support to Kyiv. Speaking after the summit, President Biden said the military alliance was stronger than ever. When Putin and his craven lust for land and power unleashed his brutal war on Ukraine, he was betting NATO would break apart. He was betting NATO would break. He thought our unity would shatter at the first testing. He thought Democratic leaders would be weak, but he thought wrong. We got a team standing by to discuss all this. In a few moments, we'll speak with former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor. But first, let's check in with Monica Alba, who's in Helsinki, and Kelly Kobiea, who is in Kyiv. Monica, let's start with you. This U.S. Nordic Summit is happening this morning. What can we expect from that? And then what came out of President Biden's meeting with the Finnish president a little earlier? Well, it has certainly been a warm welcome for President Biden here in Finland, Joe, and he will be celebrating and marking the fact that Finland was able to join NATO with record speed, the fastest member that has ever been able to join this critical alliance. And so the two leaders today in their meeting and face to face certainly touted that progress, continued to talk about how NATO is stronger than ever in the face of this Russian aggression. And we are here in Helsinki. And Finland, of course, shares a very long border with Russia and before the invasion of Ukraine had had some pretty friendly relationship with the country. So it was incredibly significant that they applied for that NATO membership and then were able to join. So certainly you will see a lot of talk about that here today. And of course, we have to note the incredible political contrast when you think about what was happening here in Helsinki five years ago to the week when former President Trump was meeting with President President Putin and where, of course, he famously said that he believed President Putin when it came to his denials about Russian election interference. So expect President Biden to also make crystal clear that the circumstances and stakes couldn't be more different here today in Helsinki than it was. And I think you can expect him to continue to clearly send that message here, Joe. So, Kelly, all these leaders are talking about Ukraine. Meanwhile, you're in Ukraine where the fighting continues. We understand there was another drone attack on Kiev overnight. What can you tell us about that? That's right. For the third night in a row, air raid sirens went off uh, last night in the early morning hours this time, about 1.30 in the morning. And you could actually hear and see the Ukrainian air defenses intercepting these drones and missiles. The Ukrainian military said that they shot down 20 drones and two missiles overnight and the falling debris injured four and damaged a couple of homes. But yeah, the third night in a row uh, for a drone attack here on, in the capital. Meantime, we're getting some new information about what the conditions may be like on the ground uh, in Russian-occupied territory for the Russian troops. Uh, Russian MP uh, overnight released an audio message purported to be from a prominent Russian general in which this general talks about uh, problems with equipment, with resources, with the morale of his troops, describing them as exhausted and not having enough reserves to come in and replace them. Now, we haven't been able to independently authenticate this audio message, but if true, it shows a real uh, problem with morale and equipment and, again, personnel in the field, on the front lines in the south of this country for the Russians, and potentially a split among top military uh, within Russia, leadership on, in the field, and back in Moscow. Joe. So, Monica, we know President Zelensky was incredibly disappointed Ukraine wasn't offered a timeline for a NATO invite. How much of an issue was that during their talks yesterday with President Biden? 
Yeah, President Zelensky certainly came into the NATO summit quite disappointed and frustrated. But over the course of about 24 hours, he did shift that tone and instead really did express a lot of gratitude to NATO leaders here who had come together certainly to continue to support Ukraine and who had pledged so much of that weaponry and continued assistance. But yes, President Zelensky did want to see something in a shorter term, though in the end, the takeaway was that he was satisfied with some of the longer term security agreements that came from it. And here's a little more from what President Biden had to say yesterday in Lithuania about how their lengthy meeting went. The one thing Zelensky understands now is that whether or not he's in NATO now is not relevant as long as he has the commitments that, remember my talking about saying we treat it like guarantee security along with a number of other NATO countries as it relates to how we deal with, for example, Israel, long term. So he's not concerned about that now. And President Zelensky was also very grateful to Americans and specifically to President Biden for those controversial cluster munitions that the U.S. is now also sending to Ukraine. Joe. And Kelly, we just heard President Biden's take on what happened at NATO. Quickly, I want to ask you, how is Zelensky reflecting on this NATO summit? Yeah, so the quote that really stands out was that he said that it was not ideal, but it was good. Uh, and I think that sums it up. The Ukraine was concerned about long-term support from NATO allies. Uh, he, some of those concerns were assuaged by that G7 uh, security guarantee. Uh, so I think, you know, in, in terms of what he can bring back to his people, his soldiers on the ground who continue to fight, are these assurances from the G7 that they're in it for the long haul, that they will have the resources they need, military equipment, economic resources, and resources to rebuild uh, going forward? Joe. All right, Monica and Kelly, thank you both. Appreciate it. Let's now bring in Bill Taylor, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and a friend of the show. Ambassador Taylor, good morning. Thank you very much for being with us. So as we mentioned, President Biden's taking part in this U.S. Nordic Leader Summit later this morning. He will hold a joint press conference with the president of Finland following their bilateral meeting. This isn't something we talk about so much. So just explain to us, put in context the importance of the relationship between the U.S. and Finland. So, Savannah, this is a very interesting trip for uh, for a president, for our president. Uh, that is uh, often, in fact, is most of the time when presidents have gone to Finland, to Helsinki, it's been for some other reason. It's to have a summit with somebody else, maybe a Soviet or a Russian, um, or it's en route from back and forth. But no, this is, uh, President Biden is in Helsinki for Finland. Um, and this is a very big deal for the Finns. Uh, the Finns have a lot of experience, uh, relevant experience for NATO and for Ukraine. As we remember, 80 years ago, the Russia, the Soviets um, attacked uh, Finland, and uh, the Finns defended themselves very well. So all to say that there's a great relationship between both Finland and Ukraine and Finland and the United States. Absolutely. Also now, let's talk about this conversation, what we've heard from President Biden after meeting with President Zelensky. He gave this speech just hours after that meeting. What were some of your takeaways from his remarks? Strong support for Ukraine. Uh, the, the one thing that President Zelensky can go home with is the recognition and the satisfaction, really, that the NATO summit focused on his country, focused on his victory. Uh, yes, he didn't get a concrete invitation to join NATO right now. That was never on the cards. But he clearly got the message that Ukraine's going to be in NATO. He clearly got the message that there's a short-term support for all of the work that all of the fighting that his troops are doing, but it's also a long-term commitment. So President Zelensky got a strong indication that, that the United States and NATO and the West is, is there with him until victory. So, Ambassador, it's been also, though, this long time coming, really, for Ukraine joining. It's been more than 15 years since NATO first promised Ukraine membership here. Uh, several countries, as you can see on your screen right now, you know, announced these new commitments, of course, but this is still, as you point out, not yet this full membership. How much of an impact does the outcome of the war in Ukraine ultimately have on the shape of NATO as we essentially wait for that event to find some type of culmination in order for Ukraine to be able to join. Absolutely right, Savannah. Um, Ukraine will not join the alliance formally um, until 
as the Ukrainians say, until the victory, un until the war is over. Um, that will be the time then for Ukraine to join. Until then, they will be using the NATO weapons. They'll be taking advantage of the NATO intelligence. Um, so they will be effectively a part of NATO, but formally will not join until, as they say, until the victory. So that's an important thing for the, the uh, Ukrainians to understand and to fight for. That's a motivation mm. for them to, to uh, uh, go for that victory. Ambassador Taylor, as always, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Savannah. Now let's get to another big story. Extreme weather across the country this morning. They are cleaning up in Chicago after some severe weather moved through overnight. Multiple reported tornadoes touched down in the area, including one at Chicago O'Hare Airport. The storms left behind a lot of damage. Large trees snapped in half, cars with smashed windows, and homes with damaged roofs. And then there's the ongoing heat wave that has been scorching southern states and is now expanding into other parts of the country. More than 80 million people are waking up to heat alerts this morning from California all the way to Florida and north into Kansas and Missouri. In cities like Phoenix, resources to help people keep cool are being stretched thin. Heat relief centers are seeing a surge in visits, as you'd expect, and city officials are making sure those who are homeless have help getting the supplies they need and finding shelter. And in Vermont, they are facing the daunting task. Look at these pictures of cleaning up after the devastating flooding we saw there earlier this week. Governor Phil Scott, FEMA FEMA officials and members of Congress visited the region to assess the damage left behind. We are covering this all across the whole country this morning. We're going to get started with NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman for your forecast. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And we are so, so busy still in the weather department. We're looking at that heat continuing. It's going to continue for days and days. No relief in sight. We're also looking at the chance for severe storms in the middle of the country and then, unfortunately, in the northeast New England in the same spots that were hit hard earlier this week. Let's first start with the heat because we're looking at 84 million people impacted. Look how far wide these alerts stretch from the Pacific Northwest into the Southwest, the South Central States, also the Southeast. So many spots soaring into the triple digits once again in the Southeast. You're not in the triple digits. You're going to feel like it once we factor in that humidity. So that dangerous, unrelenting heat does continue and lots of pink on the map that's indicating that really hot air in place. And look at these numbers. 113 in Phoenix at 7 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. 115 in Palm Springs. Tucson, 106, 109 in Las Vegas. Those triple digits continue and continue. And then as we go throughout the south central states, we're looking at Amarillo, 99 degrees. That's 8 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. That's today. Then we look towards tomorrow. This is Friday. We're looking at Las Vegas, 111, 103 in Fresno, 118 in Palm Desert, Phoenix, 115. You get the idea. We're going to keep these really hot temperatures in place. We have that heat dome that's just tacked in place. It's not budging, and it's not going to budge as we go throughout the next week or so. Albuquerque 104 tomorrow, 12 degrees above what is typical for, for this time of year. And then look as we look towards the weekend. We're looking at Phoenix 116 by Monday. Same story in Albuquerque back into the triple digits by Monday. El Paso 104 on Sunday and 106 on Monday. It's not just the southwest. It's not just the south central states that are baking. We're looking at the southeast as well, and it goes all the way up the east coast too. So New York City today, 91 degrees. That's above average. You factor in the humidity. It's going to feel like 95. It's going to feel like 100 in Norfolk, feeling like 97 in Myrtle Beach and 104 in Tampa. So that's going to continue to be a big story. Then we are also looking at this wavy cold front that's draped across the country, and we are looking at the chance for severe storms. So we're looking at severe storms in the central plains. We could see some really gusty winds, winds gusting over 60 miles per hour. We could see some large hail, baseball size hail, also a tornado or two. But notice severe storms kind of stamped there in the Ohio Valley, also portions of the Northeast. Heavy rain is expected in parts of New England, also in parts of Northeast, uh, interior parts of the Northeast. So we're talking Vermont, Eastern New York, where we had those flooding conditions earlier, finally recover. Unfortunately, we're going to see one, two, three, even up to five inches of rain in some spots. And we're going to see some thunderstorms developing. That's going to drop the rain. So we do have flood alerts uh, stretched across portions of the Great Lakes into the Northeast New England. And this is a story not only today but also tomorrow into the weekend and look at all these bright colors that is telling us that we're gonna we're expecting a lot of rain in these spots locally five inches and that's going to be a concern because the grounds are so saturated the rivers are high the streams are high the creeks are high so any additional rain is going to be runoff and where you see that pink there that's a moderate risk for some flash flooding so it's mm. not just a flooding it's flash flooding and these people are just recovering. It's yes. warm there, and we're going to see that happen all over again. Oh, mm -hmm. a broken record. Same it areas, is. too, where it's just been so dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Sure.
Let's talk more about the dangerous heat. We're going to turn now to NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin, who is in Phoenix this morning. So, Aaron, Phoenix has seen 13 straight days at or above 110 wow. degrees. I know it's early there right now, but what are conditions like? What have they been like since you got on the ground there? Yeah, Joe, it's around 4.15 in the morning here in Phoenix, and it's already 95 degrees. This is sweltering, and it's not just the high temps, but the sustained nature of this heat wave. It's just really hitting vulnerable communities especially hard. The homeless are hit hard. People living in mobile home communities as well. I was at one such community just a couple of days ago. A resident gave me a tour of her trailer. It was like an oven in Inside that trailer. She said that she was spending her summer huddled in the one tiny bedroom in the trailer that had AC. She told me that AC cost her $200 a month. She said it was breaking her budget, and that is at a discount rate. That is the reality facing thousands of people here in Phoenix and beyond as these warm, uh, these warm temperatures continue. Aaron, we mentioned just a moment ago city officials are making sure those without a home have the resources they need. How exactly are they doing that? Yeah, well, you know, these hot temperatures are no stranger to places like Phoenix. Residents are aware that there are a number of resources available to them, such as cooling centers, although we're hearing that many of those centers are already packed. We're also hearing from folks that transportation to those centers can be an issue. All of that, you know, creating what experts here are calling a crisis situation, which is why local authorities in Arizona are pushing for federal help. They want FEMA to declare extreme heat like what we're seeing right now, a, a, a disaster so they can unlock federal funds to help uh, help these communities get through this heat wave. And it's hard to believe this, Aaron, but temperatures could actually get even hotter there in coming days. Real quick, what is it people should know about the extreme heat risks? Uh, yeah, well, just experts say just know that it's dangerous. During the high heat hours during the day, make sure you stay inside. Hydration, super important. Drink that water. Also, be aware of those local resources that are in your community, such as cooling centers, to stay safe. All right. Aaron McLaughlin in Phoenix. Aaron, thank you so much. Well, a manhunt is on this morning for the driver of a car that killed one person and injured several others after being stopped by the Secret Service near the White House. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has the story. Yeah, good day. We are right at 17th and Constitution here, the center of where all the tourists come to Washington. Right across the street is the National Mall, and that, of course, is the Washington Monument. This happened in the shadow of the monument, in that crosswalk right below the monument. The Uniform Division of the Secret Service was initiating a traffic stop because of a registration problem with the vehicle. But that vehicle suddenly took off, and it came this way, southbound on Constitution. In the process, it killed, or I should say it ran over three people in the crosswalk. Walk, but one of those individuals was killed, a 75-year-old man who was taken to a local hospital. Two others were treated on the scene. Police described that vehicle as a blue 2006 Honda, again, last seen headed south on Constitution towards Virginia. This is a very, very busy part of the center of Washington. 32 million tourists every year come to the National Mall. 440,000 vehicles a day come through this area in the summer. And we are just about a block and a half away from the White House, which, of course, is the main tourist attraction in Washington. No indication that this was in any way related to an attempt on the executive branch or the president, who is out of the country right now. Instead, it seems as if this was a criminal act, somebody running over tourists, uh, apparent tourists there in the crosswalk right here in downtown D.C. Back to you. Oh, wow, scary. All right, Tom Costello, thank you so much. Turning now to Pittsburgh, where jurors are deliberating whether the shooter in the 2018 attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue should re release, receive the death penalty. Robert Bowers was already found guilty on 63 charges, including 11 hate crimes resulting in death. This phase of his trial will determine if Bowers is eligible for the death penalty. During yesterday's closing arguments, prosecutors claimed Bowers has yet to show remorse for his actions and therefore should be deemed eligible. But the defense argued a history of mental health health issues should stop jurors from handing down a capital punishment. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now for more on this trial. Hey, Danny, good morning. What is the key argument here in this second phase of the trial? What are jurors considering while they're deliberating whether or not Bauer should receive the death penalty? 
This is all about aggravating and mitigating circumstances. The prosecution has to prove aggravating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt, and the defense only has to prove mitigating circumstances, and that's anything positive about the defendant that should spare his life. They only need to prove that by a preponderance of the evidence. So the jurors are in there deliberating, most likely, about whether or not probably the mental illness evidence rises to the level of mitigating circumstances and whether or not the defense has proven that, not beyond a reasonable doubt, but just by a preponderance of the evidence. That's 51 percent or 50.00001 percent. It's just more likely than not. So the rules are slanted in favor of life. But in a case like this, when the aggravating circumstances are so horrific, mm. uh, the prosecution has a good shot of meeting, meeting their burden. So, Danny, we've heard the defense argue Bowers carried out his attack because he suffers from schizophrenia. Prosecutors claim his mental status is irrelevant, saying he had formed his intent to kill months before the shooting. In this case, is mental illness enough to decide if someone should get the death penalty? What, what is the standard here? Yes, but because we're at the penalty phase, mental illness doesn't play the role that most folks are used to seeing in a trial. Normally, they see mental illness as a defense, by reason of insanity, the person did not understand what they were doing was wrong, and therefore they're not guilty, or some variation of that. It varies a lot from state to state. But that's not what's happening here. That kind of defense is already over with. This case, the guilt phase of the case, is over. The introduction of mental illness evidence in this case is really just a an attempt at mitigating circumstances by the defense. So this is not exonerating. This is not something that will uh, that excuse the crime. It's really just about deciding at the federal level whether we're going to have a death penalty or life, because life imprisonment will be the default. And uh, the jury's recommendation here, while the jury isn't required to find death, there's no mandatory death penalty ever, but if the jury recommends death, the judge must impose death. That's what the rules say. The judge has no discretion here. It is the jury that makes the final decision. So, Danny, we've been seeing this graphic on our screen that says phase one, phase two. Uh, what happens next, and, and does that outcome change based on what the jury decides here? Is there another phase to come? No. At this point, the jury will recommend one way or another. It's called a recommendation because ultimately in the federal system, it is the judge that will essentially rubber stamp their determination. Uh, but the, ju the jury now is deliberating over simply whether aggravating circumstances outweigh mitigating circumstances, and ultimately they'll make a recommendation. If it is for death, then the judge is really just a rubber stamp. The judge just affirms what they, what they recommend and will impose death. And so the next phase, arguably after this, will simply be appeals, during which the defendant will be incarcerated no matter what, and that appeals process in the federal death penalty cases can take a very, very long time. All right, Danny Savalas, thank you so much. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.